Hello, friends, and welcome to 3ABN Worship Hour, where, as I like to always say, we worship the Lord here in spirit and in truth. That's what the Bible says, and that's what we're going to be doing during this time. We have a very, very special message today that I'm very excited to be sharing with you, and we're just going to worship the Lord in word, in song, and we're going to have a little bit of music here uh, toward the end of this presentation, but I don't want to take too much time because I want to give plenty of time for the Lord and His Word, right? Because we need to be opening our hearts and our minds, as the Bible says, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Well, we can't have the mind of Christ unless we get into his word. His word shares for us and gives to us his will for our life. So before we go any further, uh, before I reveal the title of this presentation, I want to go to the Lord in prayer right now. Let's do that. Our Father in heaven, Lord, you are so wonderful. You are so marvelous. And as I always like to start my prayers by acknowledging that you are worthy to be praised. And we thank you, Lord, for being our God. And we need not ask that you are here with us because you have promised us in your word that where two or three or more are gathered in your name, there you are in the midst. So we know you're here with us. We just ask you, Lord, to pour out your spirit up in a mighty way into our hearts, into our minds, and that we may be able to rightly divide your word of truth, that your words just come alive and that it will penetrate our hearts and minds to the point that we are drawn closer and closer to our Savior, Jesus Christ. So thank you, Lord, for your never-ending love, your wonderful grace and mercy. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. Amen. We certainly do live in a social media world now. Uh, It's kind of crazy to say that because just a few years ago, um, there really was no such thing as social media. And if it was, it really wasn't that popular. Um, Now, I happen to have a social media account. Uh, I don't spend too much time on it, but I try to use it primarily for ministry purposes, for sharing the truth, for sharing the good news of Jesus Christ through song and through inspirational quotes. And sometimes, uh, you know, the Lord will impress upon me to share something that many people might consider to be a little controversial. And, you know, the truth sometimes is controversial, not because God wants it to be, not because we want it to be, but because we live in a world where it seems like the lines are just blurred. Uh, It seems like people are questioning more and more what is truth. In fact, we're going to jump into that passage in just a moment, but I've got to set this up to reveal to you my title. I'm excited about it. Uh, Some of you may not fully get it at first, but I think throughout this uh, presentation, throughout this sermon, you will uh, understand the title. And I want to to set that up. It was um, it was a few weeks ago, back in October actually, that I made a, a Facebook post, a social media Facebook post. And I was simply just stating kind of a, asking a rhetorical question that I already know the answer to, but basically trying to plant a seed in people's minds to be able to kind of shift them in the direction of thinking about what is truth according to God's word. And so this is what I shared. So right there, you'll see Ryan Day. This is my Facebook account. And this is the message that I shared. When did truth become subjective? We now live in a world of my truth rather than the truth. And then, of course, I end it with sad and kind of a a little sad emoji there. I was just trying to share and open my heart about how it seems like as we have shifted quickly in a direction over the years, a change has occurred in the minds and hearts of people where people seem to not even know what absolute truth is anymore. It seems to be subjective. And so that's what I was sharing. Now, of course, I had many people to respond to this post as I was trying to spark people to think. I was, I was hoping that it would spark some, uh, some critical thinking in the minds of those, those people who would come across this post. And one particular post really stood out to me so much that when I saw it immediately, I burst it into laughter just because I found it a little comical at first. But as I got to thinking about it, I realized that the brother who posted this, he meant exactly what he said. And I found myself saying these very short words, this very short phrase uh, in the days and weeks to come. And so here's the very, very short response. You see it there. I kind of blocked his name and picture out. But this brother responded, True debt. 
He responded, look at that, true that. And you can see I, I responded there with kind of a laughy face. It kind of caught me off guard, true that. Of course, uh, those of you who are looking at this right now, there's some of you that are probably going, true that? What is true that? Of course, it's, it's, a, it's a type of American slang. It's a new age uh, slang of communication that really simply means that's true. It'd be like you and my, me responding to someone who said something truthful, and we might say, you know, hey, yeah, that, that's true. That's a true statement. This brother made it very clear clear when he read my post he agreed and he said true that and all I could think about <laughs> over the next hours days weeks to come as I would hear I, I about drove my wife crazy because uh, almost every little response that I would uh, give to something that I agreed with or that I thought was true I would be walking around my house saying true that true that yeah true that so uh, I, I know that it may sound a little crazy as I'm trying as I'm being a little silly here but nonetheless I want this to be a memorable sermon it may have a silly title, but I promise you this sermon title is, is given and, and, and its, its objective is to stick in your mind so that you remember the purpose of this message. And so for that reason, as I was preparing this sermon, I found myself, I found myself thinking of those words as I was preparing this sermon. And as I was going through all of the scriptures and pulling everything together and tightening everything up, all I could hear myself saying over and over and over was true that. True that. So, nonetheless, today's title of our sermon is True That. That's right. True that, because we're going to be diving deep into the Bible, my friends. And I believe that as we continue through this message and in the many days to come after you hear this message, you will remember it because of that title. And you'll probably even adopt that little bit of sling into your vocabulary as you hear truthful things. You can say true that, because it is indeed true when we're referring to the word of God, the truth of God's word. I want to jump right into John chapter 18. And the reason why we're going there is because it has one of the most famous scenes that we see in all of Scripture. Of course, I'm referring to the interrogation of Jesus Christ by the Roman governor Pontius Pilate. And that famous interrogation in which he's asking Jesus questions, but then he ultimately ends up asking a question himself. And that question is, what is truth? So let's go to the Word of God right now. John 18, beginning with verse 33. Notice what the Bible says. It says, Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus, and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Are you speaking for yourself about this? Or did others tell you this concerning me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priest have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? And Jesus answered, You rightly say that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And here's that famous verse, verse 38. Pilate said to him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. Interesting. What is truth? And the truth of the matter is we live in a day and age where the genuine truth is being attacked. We live in a day and age where most people do not really believe in an absolute truth. You're going to hear me say that quite a bit throughout this presentation. As I was preparing for this sermon, the Lord impressed upon my heart to bring attention to the absolute truth of His Word. Because we live in a day and age where many people might hold the idea or the ideology, the perspective of uh, Irish playwright Oscar Wilde when he said these words. He said, the truth is rarely pure and never simple. There's people that hold this type of mentality in the society that we live in today. Another famous quote, as I was doing research on this, I found Bob Dylan, the famous musician and singer Bob Dylan, had these words to say about truth. He said, all the truth in the world adds up to one big lie. And there are people that believe this, that there is 
no absolute truth. And we live in a world today where people have their own truth. They live according to the standard of my truth or my own truth. You have your truth and I got my truth. I have my own path. You have your own path. You have your own light and I have my own light. In fact, Oprah Winfrey, famous talk show host, uh, she had these words to say in the Huffington Post. She said, what I know for sure is that speaking your truth is the most powerful tool we have. So what she's saying here is she's simply advocating the idea that we all have our own truth. And that certainly is a reflection of what seems to be the majority of thinking today. And I'm going to hone in on this in just a few moments because you expect, you would expect the world, the world to have this mentality. In other words, people outside of the Christian church who don't necessarily identify as Christian, who don't necessarily identify as a religious person or have a particular religious belief, you expect someone from outside the church to hold these particular beliefs or to have this particular perspective. But when you get inside the church, my friends. And we see this type of mentality uh, floating around inside the church. My friends, we're in trouble. And like Oprah Winfrey said, your truth is the most powerful tool that you have. Do you have a truth? Do you have your own truth? Well, that's what the world would like you to believe. New and upcoming author Alex L. also had this to say. She said, live in your purpose. Follow your light. Love in your truth. Again, the same concept. You have a truth. I have a truth. We have to live according to our own truth. It's not absolute according to these people. Famous, uh, uh, famous actor Sylvester Stallone, listen to what he has to say as he is recorded to have said these words. He says, I believe there's an inner power that makes winners or losers. And the winners are the ones who really listen to the truth of their hearts. In other words, trust yourself. Trust your own truth. You have your own truth. You have a truth within your own heart. You need to follow your own truth that is within your own heart. Of course, another famous author, uh, influential author, Elizabeth Gilbert, she had these words to say. She said, true power comes from standing in your own truth and walking your own truth path. My friends, these are the words of the majority of the world we live in today, but I'm going to tell you today, my friends, this also seems to be the mentality, the dangerous, as I always say, stinking thinking that is entering in and lurking into the minds and hearts of Christians today. I want to share one more with you. I think this one was quite interesting. I certainly don't agree with it, uh, but uh, famous uh, uh, motivational speaker and author Steve Metaboli, I think that's how you say it, Uh, he had this to say, and he said these words. He said, stop lying to yourself. When we deny our own truth, we deny our own potential. So again, that concept that we all have our own personal truth. We all have our own reality that we live in, and that reality is ours. No one can take it away. And my friends, what we would call this is not just a dangerous mentality. It actually has a name. And we live in a world today of what uh, many of the psychologists and sociologists and philo- uh, uh, philoso- uh, you know, philosophical thinkers today call relativism. We live in a world of relativism. And simply, relativism is the concept, and I think it's summed up here in this interesting statement, Uh, My truth is what I say. My truth is what I say. My truth is what I make it out to be. You have your truth. I have my truth. And that just seems to also be the mentality of many Christians today. Again, I want to make this very clear. This message is not probably going to resonate with every single person because many people, again, have their own opinions outside of the church who may not necessarily resonate with Christianity, who may not necessarily be a Christian. I still encourage you to listen to this message because there may be something in here, a nugget of truth that the Lord wants to share with you. But my friends, I'm here to preach today to all those professed Christians who profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, who believe that they are a representative of Jesus Christ and a follower of Jesus Christ. We need to be asking the question, is truth what it really is? Is truth absolute or is it what I want it to be? Is it subject to opinion? Is truth subjective or is it objective? And speaking of relativism, let's identify what that is, because that's a big word. Many people may wonder, what is relativism? What are you speaking of or talking about when you say relativism? Here's the definition I found from Oxford Dictionary. Relativism simply is the doctrine that knowledge, truth, 
and morality exist in relation to culture, society, or historical context and are not, get this, they are not absolute. That's the concept of relativism. A person who thinks with a relativism type of thinking is a person who believes that truth it, it comes from the perspective of maybe the culture that they live in. Maybe the culture they live in defines what truth really is. Or perhaps maybe the society that they live in, their environment, will define what that truth is to them. Or perhaps maybe from a historical perspective, they're looking at history, they're studying history, and from a historical perspective, they have determined that there is a certain truth to them personally Personally, that may not necessarily exist to everyone else. In other words, everyone has their own truth. And the dangers of relativism, my friends, is simply this. Let me just spell it out very clearly for you. The dangers of relativism is the fact that people who believe in this relativism, the concept that they have their own truth, simply believe that now they live in their own reality. It separates them from the objective, truthful reality that each and every one of us are bound to. In other words, they're not bound to the same objective reality, the same objective truth that everyone else is. They live in and of their own reality, and because they have their own truth, their own light, their own path of, in this case, we're going to use the word righteousness for a Christian's perspective. My friends, we have to understand that according to relativism, if you believe this thinking, if you have this stinking thinking concept that your truth is your own truth, you have your own truth, you have your own way, that everything is, is according to your own is subject to your own opinion my friends at the end of the day we have to understand what we are doing is we are destroying the foundations of communication we're going to a point to where we no longer can communicate rightfully with each other or correctly with each other or or, or understand in, in, a, in a in a in a for sure absolute way what truth really is because even within the christian church the truth is being eroded at the absolute truth is found in god's word so I'm going to ask a question. Should Christians view truth as absolute? If, if I am a Christian and I'm identifying myself as a Christian, should truth be absolute? Well, first, before we answer that question, I want to identify what a Christian is. Okay, I have a very clear, simplistic definition that, of course, I have created based on the Bible as well as some other dictionaries and, and uh, definitions that we found. But we pulled some sources together to bring about a very simplistic, very clear, foundational definition of what a biblical Christian is. And here it is. A Christian is someone who follows Jesus Christ in obeying His Word for the purpose of replicating His character. It's that simple. Someone who follows Jesus Christ in obeying His Word for the purpose of replicating His character. You are a follower of Jesus. You want to replicate the right righteousness of Jesus. You, you know your righteousness is like filthy rags, as the Bible says. You need Jesus Christ's righteousness to be your own. In other words, you want to be like Christ. But in order to be like Christ, my friends, we have to understand that we have to be obedient to His Word, that we have to be obedient to His following. And so... I have another definition for you, because not everyone is a Christian, obviously, but many people identify as a Christian. But you know, there are some people that identify as a Christian that really aren't Christians. In fact, this one is a, is a Ryan Day specialty that I'm about to bring up. Uh, I, I believe that many people, while they believe they're actually Christians, they're actually not Christians. They are what I like to call selfshins. That's right, S-E-L-F-shin, like Christian selfshin, okay? And here's the definition of a selfshin. Someone who may profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, but does not follow His Word, this person lives according to their own understanding rather than the truth of God's Word. That's right. Relativism. Truth is subjective. Truth is what I want it to be. I have my truth, you have your truth, and my truth is I believe I'm a Christian, I believe I'm a follower of Jesus, I believe I'm saved, but at the end of the day, my friends, we have to be honest with ourselves. Just because you may profess that you are a Christian doesn't make you a Christian because you very well may find yourself in the selfshin camp. And I'll tell you what clearly at the end of the day separates a selfshin from a Christian. Many of those things that I just mentioned is absolutely true. But let's get a little deeper here. You see, we all as, as Christians claim to believe in the Bible. We claim to follow the Bible. Now this Bible is comprised of 66 books. 
Okay, and you may have a different version. I have here the New King James Version. I have many different versions of Scripture in my library. New or King James, New King James, NIV, you go down the list. I, when I study the Word of God, sometimes I look at many different versions of the Bible. But a selfshin has a special version. A selfshin has their own version. In fact, this is a special version that most Christians have in their library. They may not be able to see it all the time, but they certainly refer to it. I just like to call it the self-revised version. That's right, the self-revised version. Of course, I'm being a little facetious here for the purpose of proving a point. Many people go by their own self-revised version. They pick a little here, take a little here. They've created their own little truth, their own little Christian bubble. But at the end of the day, my friends, we're going to ask the question, same question uh, today that uh, we've read that uh, Pilate asked, what is truth? For a Christian, what is truth? And inside this self-revised version, again, I'm being a little facetious here, but I'm trying to make a point. We have two special books. Instead of 66 books, we have 68 books. And the two added books in most selfsions is the first opinions and second opinions. Two special books, first and second opinions. My friends, let me make it clear here. We may all have an opinion. We may all have a version of our truth that we may think and and create and exist in our own minds. But at the end of the day, as we're going to learn, truth is absolute. In fact, that's the question we're asking right now. In fact, for the purpose of this, everything that we've just said up to this point, you know what we can respond to? We can just simply say, true that, because all that's true that we just said. True that, very clearly. You can say it with me. I can hear you saying it at home. True that. That's right. We're asking the question, is truth absolute for Christians. Should Christians believe that truth is absolute? I want to know what Jesus said, because since I'm a follower of Jesus, I'm a Christian, I want to know what Jesus said. And Jesus tells us in John chapter 14, these beautiful words, we know it, John chapter 14, verse 15, he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you're going to be a follower of Jesus Christ, Jesus says you must love me. And in showing me that love, you're going to be obedient to my commandments. Of course, we know that's a big part of the word of God. And in that same chapter, Jesus is recording to have said these words. John chapter 14, verse 23, Jesus says and answers to Jesus answered to them and said, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. But he goes on to verse 24 and he says, He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not of mine, but of the Father's who sent me. So the question we're asking, let me bring it up one more time. Should Christians view truth as absolute? Got a question. Did Jesus view truth as absolute? Yes, he did. And we're about to see that right now. Notice what the Bible says here. In John chapter 18, again, verse 37, we read this earlier, but just to be reminded, Jesus viewed truth as absolute. And as Christians, should we view truth as absolute? Because if we're Christians, remember, we're a follower of Jesus and his word, as we just read. We can't be a follower or claim to be a follower of Jesus and not follow his word or not keep his words, as he just said. So we're going to go to John 18, beginning with verse 37 again. Notice what Jesus had to say. He said, for this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to, notice, the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Notice, even in the original Greek right here, where I've highlighted those words, the truth, you find the definite article. Jesus was clear, my friends. Jesus believed that the truth was absolute because he used the definite article. He just didn't say, look, uh, I've come into the world to reveal a truth, that everyone who hears my voice, they are of a truth. No, 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 no. He said they're of the truth. I've come into this world to preach and to declare and to live out the truth. That's why he also said in that famous verse found in John chapter 8, verse 32. We almost have it memorized because we say it often. Sometimes we say it a little wrong, but here are those famous words in John 8, verse 32. Jesus says, and you shall know, there it is again, the definite article, the truth and the truth shall make you free. That's right, my friends. Jesus was clear that truth is indeed absolute. It's not something that we create. It's not something that exists in our own little alternate reality. Jesus made it true and clear that truth is absolute. In fact, even referring to himself, and we're going to highlight this a little more in just a moment, but you know that famous verse found in John chapter 14, verse 6. I love it. Jesus referring to himself, he said, I am the way. 
the truth. There it is again, definite article, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And we read all those texts. We read all that truth about how Jesus is the truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And to that I can say because I believe 100% that Jesus is the truth, I say true that. That's right. True that. You can say it with me. True that. Because that is true. Amen. And we can, be, we can know and rely on the fact that that is indeed true. So the question is, can Christians know what truth is today? Okay, we know that truth is absolute, but can we know what that absolute truth is now? Many people today would say, no, not really, right? Because, you know, may, maybe truth exists. Maybe that absolute truth is out there somewhere, but we can't really know what it is. Again, that's that stinking thinking, that relativism. We don't want anything, any part of that. Because as Christians, Jesus was very, very clear as to what he wanted us to believe. And so... I want to just bring a series of texts together to answer this question. Can Christians know what truth is today? Let's start with Jesus' words because, again, He is the way, He is the truth, He is the life, and this is what He said in Matthew 4, 4 as He was being tempted by the devil. We know those famous words. He said here, uh, He said to him, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So notice here, Christ is making a definitive statement. He's saying, look, if you're going to be a follower of me, if you're going to be of me, I've created man. I am the creator. He says, and I'm telling you, man that I've created should live by the word of God. They should live only by what comes from the mouth of God. Now take that and tie that to John 17, 17, when Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he said these famous words, sanctify them. That is, make them holy, set them apart, sanctify them through thy, there it is, truth. Thy word is truth. I love that. Thy word is truth. And so, my friends, now take that. Again, we're building some blocks here. And connect that to Psalm 119, 160. I love this, this one, the 119th chapter of Psalm. So much packed in that chapter. Notice what David writes here. He says, the entirety... Oh, the entirety of your word is truth. And every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. Okay, so let's take the two texts that we've just read. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And David makes it clear under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Lord, the entirety of your word is truth. Guess what? That means from Genesis to Revelation, we can know what truth is. We can know that the absolute, definitive, clear, genuine truth of God's word is found right here in the Bible. Bible, and we can trust that every single word is from God and that it is trustworthy. That's why I love, again, Psalm 119. It's one of my favorite chapters. 119, that famous verse found in verse 105. It says, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So God's word is a light. And if you've ever been in a dark place, you desire to see, right? You desire light. God's word is that light. That's what God inspired his Bible prophets to say, that his word is that light. It is the lamp that lights our path. Now, keep that in mind. God's word is a what? It's a light. Now, take that in consideration when we read Isaiah 8, verse 20, because the question we're asking is, can we know what this absolute truth is? Here it is, Isaiah 8, verse 20, to the law. And to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Did you hear that? When we don't speak as Christians, oh, I just wish I could scream this from the mountaintop. When we as Christians, my friends, come up with this, this messy thinking that, you know what? Truth is what I want it to be. Truth is, I've got my own truth. I've got my own ideas. I've got my own perception. Oh, here's a, here's a dangerous one. I've got my own interpretation. Ryan, that's your interpretation. Well, I have my own interpretation. Oh, Ryan, that's, 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 that's true for you, but, but it's not necessarily true for me. My friends, if we are Christians, true, genuine Christians, then we are of Jesus Christ. And if we are true, genuine Christians, then we are of the Word of God, which means we believe harmoniously that the foundational, absolute, finite truth at the end of the day is God's Word. 
And if we don't speak according to this word, according to Isaiah 8 verse 20, when we don't speak according to this word, the Bible says there is no light in us. You know what that means? That means the word of God is not in you. Because again, the word of God is a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. We don't have God's word in us. And when we don't have God's word in us, we don't have God in us. Woo! Man, so to all of that that I just said, say it with me, true that, all of that is true, true that, absolutely. So why should the Bible be received as the ultimate truth? You know, these are questions that a very skeptical, philosophical thinker of today would ask. Okay, Ryan, there's a genuine truth. Okay, it's found. But what about the Word of God? I mean, what is it, what is it about it that, that, that tells me that I should receive it as the ultimate truth, right? And I'm going to show you some, statistics, some disturbing statistics in just a moment, my friends, that tell us that Christians, professed Christians today, they believe that truth, that is their religious biblical truth, is subject to opinion. I'm going to show you that more Christians, more than half of the Christians in this world today, believe that mess. And I believe it's a dangerous, dangerous thinking. So why should the Bible be received as the ultimate truth? Well, let's consider this truth. And I made a note here very clear for all of us to see. You see, the Bible, and this is, this is the foundation of it right here. The Bible identifies truth as a quality intrinsic to the very nature of God. And this should not come as too much of a surprise to us since the Bible is primarily, say it with me, about whom? Jesus Christ. So why should the Bible be that ultimate final truth for us? Because it's about Jesus Christ. It identifies Him. It identifies the character of God. You can't separate the Word of God and you can't separate the Word of God from God. Jesus indeed called Himself the truth. He was full of the truth. The Bible makes it clear that he told the truth. The Bible makes it clear that uh, it says that, you know, whose words are true according to Revelation 21 and, verse, and chapter 22 as well. Jesus also taught the way of God in truth according to the book of Matthew there as well as Mark and Luke. You'll see the references on the screen. Jesus also taught about the truth. Right there, we read John 17 earlier. John 17, 17. Thy word is truth. He taught about the truth. And of course, he came into the world to bear witness to the truth, according to John chapter 18. My friends, we have to understand that the Bible has a better and higher standard. It is a better and higher standard. It defines truth as being utterly reliable and enduring. And the reason is simple. Authentic biblical truth is inextricably linked to the dependable, unchangeable character of God. It identifies who God is. It tells the story of the character of God. Truth cannot, listen to these words, truth cannot be unhinged from absolutes. Even though everyone's got their own opinion as to what truth is and they live in their own little reality. Well, this is my truth and that's your truth. My friend, true, genuine truth for Christians cannot be unhinged from absolutes. You see, you can trust everything God says. He never lies. He always keeps His word. And of course, He's faithful to all his promises. That's why David was able to write in Psalm 31, verse 5, very clearly. I love this. He says, And to your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. You see, David wrote that under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit because God is truth. And so as Christians, when we come to this idea that, well, that's true for you, that's not true for me. My friends, 40, more than 40,000 different denominations that exist today, and the question is why? If we all have the same truth, if we all have the same foundational amazing truth that's found in God's Word, and we all claim to be followers of Jesus, why in the world we got 40,000 different denominations? I'm going to reveal to you in just a moment why we have 40,000 different denominations. It's because even Christians today, the majority of Christians today, live in a false reality of relativism. They believe that the truth of God's Word is subjective and that it's subject to opinion and personal ideology, uh, ideological thinking. 
Numbers chapter 23 verse 19 tells us another amazing truth about God. A beautiful promise. It says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? <laughs> love that. I love how, how, how Moses is just, uh, he's just unpacking it right there. He's saying, look, who is God? He's the truth. When he speaks, listen and believe. Because when he speaks, he speaks truth. His promises are sure. He cannot lie. In fact, Paul even echoed this message in Titus chapter 1, verses 1, 2, and 3. Let's read that right now. Notice what Paul writes. He says, Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of, here it is, the truth, which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life, which God, there it is again, who cannot lie, promised before time began. I love that. I just want to pause there for a moment before we go into verse 3. I just want to highlight that and reemphasize the fact that God cannot lie. He is unchangeable. But now notice what he continues to say in verse 3. He says, but has in due time manifested his word through preaching. I love that. Which was committed to me according to the commandment of God, our Savior. Did you catch that? How was this truth brought to him? By the word. And of course, it was committed to him according to the commandment of God our Savior. You know, speaking of the commandment, let me ask this question. What governing principles epitomize the truth as found in God's character? What should Christians believe on that? What governing principles epitomize the truth as found in God's character? You know, that, that, that's just an overwhelming, clear answer. If you are a Bible Christian, then you know it is none other than God's law, the Ten Commandments. In fact, notice in Psalm, again, 119, verse 142, notice what David writes. He says, your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your law is truth. You see, the law of God tells the truth because it is a transcript of the character of God. The law of God tells us who God is, who is truth. And therefore, my friends, if we're going to be Christians living in these last days, should we be preaching that the law is done away with? Because in a sense, we're preaching and teaching that the law, of course, if it's done away with, then that means we're doing away with the loving character of God. Mm. You can't separate God from his law because it tells the same story. In fact, I'll put some references up here. I'm not going to read all of those references, but I want to show you here. The Bible makes it very clear that God and His law are good. They are holy. God and His law are perfect, pure, just, true, spiritual, righteous. They are righteousness, faithful, love, unchanging. And I love this last one, eternal. <laughs> God is eternal. His law is eternal. His word is eternal. Guess what? Truth is eternal. Guess what? True that. That's what you need to be saying right now. True that. Because all of that is true about God and His Word. I told you after this sermon, you're going to be saying it at home. I've been saying it. Makes me feel good. I like to say it. It's fun. Because we need to live in a day and age where the truth, when the truth is being attacked, when the truth is being eroded at every corner, God needs a people that's going to stand firm on the truth. Not a truth, not a version of our own personal truth, but we need to be standing on the truth of God's Word. So I want to ask another important question right now. Why do so many professed Christians struggle with accepting and formulating their lives around the truth of God's Word? Why does it seem like so many Christians are failing to receive this truth, are failing to accept it as true? And you say, well, Ryan, I, I don't really know of any Christians that are... I'm going to show you some starting statistics in just a moment. But I want to I show you from a biblical perspective why this is the case. First of all, I'm going to read a text. One of the shortest texts in all of Scripture. But I believe it's one of the most, truly one of the most inspired texts that we can find in Scripture. It was written by Paul. And Paul says this very short sentence. Five words. Do not quench the Spirit. In other parts, he talks about how we should, not, uh, we, sh we, we should not grieve the Holy Spirit. So why are Christians struggling to accept 
the actual, absolute, genuine truth of God's Word today for what it is? Well, because the majority of Christians today are quenching the Spirit. You see, and when you quench the Spirit, let me tell you a little bit of something about the Spirit here. In fact, I'm going to let Jesus tell you a little bit of something about the Spirit. In fact, we've all read it, but in case you haven't, this is what the Bible says in John chapter 16, verse 13. Jesus says, however, when he, notice what he recall, what he calls the Spirit. He says, when he, the Spirit of truth, there it is. When the Spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into how much truth? All truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. So get this. Why are Christians struggling? Because they're quenching the Spirit. If the spirits, one of the Spirit's attributes and purposes is to come into this world to show us truth, to reveal all truth to us, but yet we're quenching the Holy Spirit. My friends, we're quenching the life source of truth. In fact, notice what Jesus said in Matthew 13, verse 13 through 15. This is the result of quenching the Spirit of truth. Jesus says, hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull, their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes have been closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. You know what Jesus is saying here? He's saying when you cut off the source of truth, when you are quenching the Spirit of God in your life, when you're grieving the Holy Spirit, you're taking away, the, 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 you're cutting off, you're severing the spiritual supply line of truth for your life. And when you do that, guess what? You may have eyes, but you can't see. You may have ears, but you can't hear. You may have a mind, but you're not really perceiving. That's why we have so many people today. I walk around with the plain truth of God's Word, and I'll be showing people, teaching people the truth that's found in God's Word. And one of the most in interesting, intriguing things to hear is when you actually show someone the plain, simple truth of God's Word, and they look at that and say, well, I don't see that. Well, of course you don't see that, because having eyes you can't see, having ears you can't hear. And the reason why many people are in this case is because they're quenching the leading, guiding power of the Spirit of truth in their life. That's why Paul goes on to write in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Notice what he says. This is ultimately the prophetic, uh, 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 this is a prophecy basically of what's going to happen uh, when people sever that connection, when they can no longer see. This is what it says, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 beginning in verse 10. He says, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. Why are they perishing? Here's why they're perishing. Because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. That they all may be condemned who did not believe, there it is again, the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. My friends, this is the world we live in today. And it breaks my heart. As a Christian living among other Christians, we should all, as Jesus Christ prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, we should all be in one mind and one accord. We should all be on the same biblical page, but the truth is we're not. And the reason why is because the, the, the church is flooded with wheat and tares, with Christians and selfians, those who live in their own false alternate reality and those who are grounded to the absolute truth of God's Word. And Jesus said, light and darkness cannot coexist. Why do you, want to, why, why do you think the church is, is so divided today? Never been divided as much as it is today because the devil's attacking the truth. In fact, notice what Isaiah 59 verses 14 and 15 has to say. <laughs> this, is, this is somewhat of a prophecy even for our time. Notice here. It says, justice is turned back and righteousness stands afar off. For truth is fallen in the street and equity cannot enter. So truth fails and he who departs from evil makes himself. A prey. Don't you feel like that sometimes? When you finally decide and you, you've seen the light and you want to bring yourself in harmony with the light of God's Word, it seems like you become an enemy to everyone around you. Mm. You become a prey. That's the Word of God, not my, not my words. Look at these statistics. According to a 2019, I think, I think actually I made, a, I made a, a typo here, but I'm going to clarify it. It's either 2019 or 2018. Um, but notice this, this is a legitimate study that I found online. Get this. 
And this is a statement that they made. You'll see it up there on the kind of in the top left-hand corner there. It says, religious belief is a matter of personal opinion. It is not about objective truth. So they wanted to know what evangelicals believe about this, that is Christians. So they made this statement and they wanted to know, do you agree with this statement or do you not? My friends, look at this. 47%, okay, only 47% strongly disagreed with this statement. Less than half of the Christians polled disagreed with this statement, as they should have. Because truth is not a matter of personal opinion, it is, it, it, and that it is an objective truth. But yet, notice, more than 50, at this point, 53% of the people, everyone else, even that group that said somewhat there, somewhat, I somewhat disagree. If you somewhat disagree with that, my friends, then you're not grounded in the genuine truth of God's Word. You fall in the camp with the rest of them. 53% of Christians said that they either somewhat or, you know, pretty much agree with the fact that, yeah, truth is subject to opinion. My goodness, Lord have mercy on us. In fact, if you go on to look at the next uh, study that I found here, a 2019 Lifeway research study again, how much of the Bible, they ask, how much of the Bible have you personally read? Look at this. 10% says none of it. Only a few sentences uh, for, people, for 13% of those who took this uh, uh, survey. 30% said several passages or stories. 15% said at least half of it. 12% said almost all of it. And of course, only 19% said all of it or all of it more than once. My friends, th there's a large number of Christians that took this survey, and this is the results. This is the world that we live in. And you say, Ryan, why is that such a big deal? Because listen to this statistic. If this one doesn't bother you, get this. According to the American Bible Society, now they don't have a slide for this one, but I want to, I want to just verbalize this one very clear. According to a recent American Bible Society survey, out of almost 9 out of 10 households, that's 87%, own a Bible. And the average household has three Bibles. But yeah, we don't, we don't agree with what truth is anymore. Because there's more than 40,000 different denominations. Why? Because we got a bunch of people who have their own version of the truth. This is the world we live in. You can't put 10 Christians in a room anymore and agree on the absolute truth of God's Word. Everyone's got their own opinion. 40,000 different opinions. My friends, have mercy. Well, where have we come as society? And again, this bar graph here, 2019. Notice this. Which of the following described the Bible to you? And look at this. 52% said a good source of morals. 38% said his, a good historical account. 37% said it's helpful today, but the one that bothers me the most is 36% of the people that took this survey said that they believe that the Bible is true. Only 36%. <laughs> My friends, and we wonder why Paul preached, and I can just imagine this brother preaching it with power from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 2 and onward, when he said, preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke with, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come. This is a prophecy, my friends. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust, again, their own opinion, their own thinking, their own truth, shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their truth excuse me, their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. And I can tell you as a response to what we just read, I can say, true that. True that. That's the reality of what we live in today in Christianity. Many people living according to their own lust, their own truth, their own desire. So I want to ask with the last couple of minutes remaining that I have and the bulk of this sermon here. I just want to make this very clear. How can we make sure that we are grounded, that is always grounded, in the genuine truth of God's Word? Well, let me give you this text. It's one of my favorite ones. And I rely on it to keep me humble and to keep me in check often. And that's found in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. The Bible says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your path. Mm, I love that. You see, when you're a true, genuine Christian, that is a true, genuine follower of Jesus, you don't trust yourself. 
You don't trust your own way. That's why the Bible says over in Proverbs 14, 12 somewhere, I think it's Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. That's why Paul says in 2 Timothy 2, 15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You see, we do need to read the word of God. You need to be reading your Bibles each day. But more than that, my friends, we need to be studying the Word of God. We need to be students of the Word of God. How can we be grounded to the plain truth of God's Word, the absolute truth of God's Word, if we're not students of the Word, if we don't trust in the Lord more than we trust in ourselves? But it seems like more and more Christians today, instead of trusting in God, they trust in themselves more than they trust in God. And therefore, because they trust in themselves more than they trust in God, they become their own God. I want to trust in the light of God's Word. I want to believe right there in Psalm 119, 105, when it says, Plain and clear, thy word, your word, O God, is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Mm. Do you trust in the Word? Are you a true Christian or are you a self Do you have your own self-revised version? But those two added first and second opinions that you rely on quite a bit, or do you rely on a plain, thus saith the Lord? You see, we need to learn to trust in God because it's only His strength that's going to get us through, not our own. At this moment, I would like to allow my brothers, Tim Pardon and Pastor John Lomacain, to bless us with a song. It's going to talk about how God is our strength and we should place our trust in Him. Sometimes life seems like words and music that can't quite become a song. So you cry inside, then you try again, wondering what could be wrong. Then you turn to the Lord at the end of your We've done a time or two before We find the truth is the same As it's always been You never will need more It's not in trying But in trusting Not in running but in resting, not in wandering, but in praying, that we find the strength of the Lord. It's not in trying, but in trusting, not in running, but in resting, not in That you'll find the strength of the Lord. He's all we need for our every need. We never need be alone. But He'll let go if we choose to live a life on our own then the only good that will ever be said from the pain we find ourselves in there are praises to gain and the wisdom to say I'll never leave him again. It's not in trying, but in trusting. Not in running, 
but in resting, not in wandering, but in praying, that you'll find your strength in the Lord. No, it's not in trying, but in trusting, not in running, but it's in resting. Not in wandering, but in praying that you find your strength in the Lord. Not in wandering, but in praying that you find the strength of the Lord. Praise the Lord. You guys couldn't have chosen a better song. It's really, really good. Thank you. My friends, the Bible reminds us of one of my favorite texts, one of the most beautiful promises in all of Scripture. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, which says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. You see, some of us need to take a big bite of humble pie every once in a while. You see, the only way we can come to understand and to truly submit ourselves to that absolute, genuine truth of God's Word is if we are humble. And if we humble ourselves in God's presence. You see, it's really all about surrender at the end of the day. You're surrendering your will to Him. And so in closing now, I do want to say thank you for joining us. But I want to give a final appeal to surrender your will to the Lord right now. You say, Lord, I don't don't trust my thinking. I don't trust my truth, if there is such a thing. Of course there's not. His truth is the only truth that matters. Let us pray as we close. Father in heaven, simple and clear, we want your truth. We need the only truth that matters, and that is your truth. Give us your Holy Spirit. Teach us your will. Teach us your ways. And take us away here today. We ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.